All right, so it is going to be Daniel Sveshnikov and we are going to have a look at some of the most important anchor games I could find. And fittingly, we are going to start with a game called Chekhov Sveshnikov. Well, it's not called, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, these are the players. Um, um, so it's... Screen share, please. Oh, yes, that's right, which is going, <laughs> which is going to mess with us, of course. Uh, wait, how do I do that thing again? Share screen. Um, which screen do we want to share now? Oh boy, the one with the chessboard. That <laughs> that looks like it. All right, do you have visual? Uh, it should come up in just a second. Yeah, it did. It did. There it is. Yep. Okay, I see so it. now I have this. No, I don't have this. Okay, this Zoom thing is the most confusing thing ever. All right, so Chekhov Sveshnikov. Um, that's the fourth on the list, as you can see. But this is where, where we kick off because this is one of the most fun. So let's swap the board around. So what I wanted to tell you, Daniel, this is the most important thing. The Sveshnikov is pretty much the only Sicilian I can think of. The only Sicilian where it is almost always black conducting the attack and the aggression. The vast majority of Sicilians run parallel. White is hitting you, you are hitting back. Yeah, Dragon, Knight of, Paulzen, you name it. We are having a go at each other. The Sveshnikov in its dynamics is very different because there hmm. what happens is that you are offering multiple positional concessions, quite serious ones. But as a result of that, White's play is hardly ever directed against your king in a shape of an attack. It is almost always trying to be a positional dismantling and stirring towards an endgame. And it's you who is doing the hammering, the punching, the hitting, the, the real aggro. And so in essence, what you really need to have Daniel here, surprise, surprise, is a super aggressive mindset and mentality. Every step of the way, you want to hurt me. Every step on the way, of the way. And every move you make must be the most aggressive, most annoying, most pressing one you do. And this example right here is going to be beautifully modeling this. Uh, I have got this study open twice, which is really annoying. Probably even thrice. Yeah, classic me. It's five million tabs. Right, so note that this is a potential uh, move order for the Sveshnikov as well. But uh, we will talk about the theoretical aspects later, it's irrelevant. So now we are in a position that you recognize as the Sveshnikov, right? Yep. So a6, b5, this is your bread and butter. And here the two big variations are bishop f6 and knight d5. So right. the first game we are going to look at is going to go with bishop f6 and you take back with the pawn. Now, the essence, the ultimate... Uh, Sveshnikov strategy actually relies on these double pawns. They are one of your greatest assets in order to undermine the center and fight for the light squares by virtue of playing f5. And sometimes we take and then f5 again. And equally often we push past, gaining more space on the king side and then sending second Freddy uh, up on the f file to do the damage on the uh, central pawn. So knight d5, okay. f5, this is theory. So is bishop g7 for the record. And in fact, I don't know which uh, variation your course recommends, but I would suggest that you actually play both because they are cl quite different, but really fun, both of them in their unique way. So f5, queen d3. Now that is not normal. So the main lines here are bishop d3 and pawn c3. So in case you don't know theory, I'm telling you now that the main and EF5 as well is theoretical. But Queen D3 is immediately making you go like, hmm, this is this is looking sus. I'm coming after mm -hmm. you. Now you would be immediately extremely tempted to take take and play pawn F5 in the spirit of the Sveshnikov. However, that appears to me to be a tactical blunder. I didn't know this by the way, but I just figured it out. I hope I did. That he knight F6 check followed by bang bang is gonna hurt us yeah <laughs> so hence bishop g7 and now we are genuinely considering castles and then bang bang okay. so they took and you just don't care like losing a pawn like that you literally i always tell you to not to take notice here it's like 
nah, that that means that you're doing things well. If you are not at least a pawn or two down in the Sveshnikov, curve, it means you are some you're messing up something drastically. Queen e4, <laughs> knight d4. Now this is extreme aggression, Daniel. Like this is what I want you to soak in. Like there was no tomorrow that the guy says, ah. Oh, I don't want you to move your knight because if you did, then I was going to give you or I will give you a check and then I pick off your rook. And your gut reaction to that is that, okay, do that. Because in a, your opponent doing that, they spend even more time playing moves with pieces that are developed and delaying even more castling and in general uh, mobilizing the remainder of their army. And note that in the process of doing this... By the way, this is a beautiful way to win a full rook. Because now after bishop takes, we are actually trading on f6 when the rook drops, opposed to giving away the full knight. But I'm, I would like to demonstrate to you that this whole knight d4 idea leads to look at this. Takes, 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 takes. And you have mobilized your entire army. Mm. I have a hanging queen, a disaster knight, and back rank fest. This is the wet dream of a Sveshnikov player. <laughs> so seriously, man, take a mental shot of this. Yeah. And every time you can acquire a position like this, where your opponent is busy munching material and your pieces are just coming out, 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 out. And you are literally just rolling over them in terms of development and initiative. This is ultimate Sveshnikov. Now it is so strong. That, in fact, you can afford losing a full rook here after f6 takes, 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 takes. We have the exact same story without your bishop on g7, and it is still sound. Mm. This is just absolutely beautiful chess. b4, and now the knight is glued to a3, because if it leaves, then you pick off the full rook, and you are going to expose the white king. So now we are going to regain at least an exchange. So white is now trying their best to just tuck that king away before the whole house burns down. So now you <laughs> now you play bishop f5, hitting queen, hitting bishop. The queen rolls back. You eliminate one defender of c2. And also deny castling, by the way. Yep. And now we eliminate the other one. So now knight c2 is a threat again. So that they must castle. And after a, b2, rook e1, this is a good time to take stock. Right? Because now we can say, alrighty, the dust has settled. Let's see who is ahead. And so if you really want to do that, which I think you should, you can conclude that um, we have got 1.40 exchange. So technically mm -hmm. we are materially still a bit down. However, the b2 pawn is a mighty beast. The d4 knight is on an outpost, uncontested for the rest of eternity. So overall, absolutely 100% you would prefer to play this with black. Right. There's just right. no other way that white can be better here. White, black played rook b8, very aggressive. Again, for hinting the idea that promotion might come at one point. Knight c2, hitting rook and planning knight a3 followed by promote. Mm-hmm. Rook b1, knight a3, and this is basically game over now. h3 was played. Yep. Take, take. Uh, this is 100% time trouble issue here. Um, yeah, it's a little bit baffling why black would play here h6. To be honest, obviously queen f2, queen d6 is a bit iffy because the rook is hanging. So maybe something like rook b6 would make sense to me. I think this was just time trouble. Yeah, so the idea is that if queen d6... Actually, I want you, um, Daniel, to work this out. What happens here, sir? Uh, let's see. How do we mop this up? Looking at queen c1 check. Um, mm -hmm. King here? If... Right. Um, so, queen takes h1. Uh, you mean b1? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, b1. <laughs> I don't know what yeah, saying. and if check? Uh, queen... Right. Um, 
Let's see. Wait, king, uh, king h7. Just trying to step out of the way of a second check. Yeah, I know what you're doing. My problem there, Daniel, is is that if I play something like queen b7, then I'm still covering this. I'm not sure if b7 is best, and I'm threatening with a perpetual check. Okay. So it may be winning, but you have got a far cleaner way to mop this up than going in for this check. Okay. What would hmm. that be? Let's see. Hmm. It's a little tricky. Hmm. This whole situation is begging for back rank mate, no? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess you could go rook c8. Yep, and this is unstoppable. Threatening mate in one, yeah. Yep, and it's game over. Mm. So uh, that's why they played queen c6 to deny this. I see. Yeah, I see. Queen d2. Um, cover, guarding the pawn. So now you can start thinking about doing stuff like rook here, rook here, among others. Okay. But you're also simply yep. threatening to take the pawn and book. <laughs> right. And so queen c4 was played, but it's not good enough. And they resigned because the queen check is covered by the rook. Excuse me. And there is no way to stop the d3 capture. So let's rewind this tape, Daniel, because that was a bit of a whirlwind of a game. So what happened here? White went queen d3, which was very sus. We did the best thing that a chess player can do in any opening. We play principled chess against unprincipled garbage. We develop, we develop, and we strike. Yep. And even at the cost of a rock, we have built up so much pressure on the misplaced knight, the c2 pawn, and thus the king and rook, that we managed to rake back plenty enough material whilst, and this is super important, whilst we retained the initiative, yeah? By the way, uh, what's wrong with rook b1 here, very quick? Hmm. Um... Uh, why it's wrong. I'm not entirely sure why it's wrong. I mean, it seems easy enough to defend with rook b8, but I feel like defense is not the mentality here, right? I was about to say that. Uh, uh, I don't know why you're saying yeah. that using that word. Like, that, that has been banned. <laughs> it's right. officially out of your vocabulary forever. Right, like, right. Not happening. Um, so I mean, we have a check, but I don't, I don't see the follow through on that with, uh, with the ninety two check. Really? Uh, yeah. Okay. So ninety two check, king h one, and then. Hmm. I. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I should see that, right, right. Okay, so then after king h1, knight c3, and then you fork. Yeah, so this is uh, this is the yeah. takeaway, Daniel, from last lesson that I told you that these little tactics, you need to be a lot sharper and faster on them. I'm working on it. Yep. I'm working on it. I yeah. know you are, but uh, I just <laughs> wanted to, because if I don't get to publish this, uh, at least we the viewers will get a bit of uh, an intel on where we are headed. So you are going to smash right. these like an absolute champ. So that was it, man. That was it. And for the record, yeah. this made Luke Chekhov look like an absolute rookie. And he was a very <laughs> strong grandmaster at the time. The funny thing is that all the games I'm going to show you today were lost by White, who are very well-known, established, very strong grandmasters. The next one is the most shocking of all. It was played between uh, Psahis and Weiser. Weiser was a French dude and Psahis is an Israeli GM. He was the second of uh, Judith Polgar amongst others. And he was a very strong 2600 GM. You see, if you look at the screen about how long this game went. 
<laughs> that that that's the that's the actual game. Like uh, I didn't incorrectly copy the PGN and the rest was cut off. No. <laughs> That's uh, how this this story ended. This is one of my favorite variations, um, and that is going to be the b5 bishop takes pawn takes knight d5 bishop g7 one. So the idea with this line, Daniel, is is that you delay playing f5, and you challenge mm -hmm. the knight on e7. Excuse me, on d5 first by playing knight e7. Usually those two get traded off, and then you immediately strike at the center by playing f5 and very often d5 as well. And almost always both of them are hanging for free and you just don't care. This game is a textbook example of this. Now, nowadays in the computer era, this variation has been proven still playable, but through some really funky, wonky variations. But uh, the way how it was meant to be played is beautifully modeled in this game. So knight e7, and now the trade is forced because white does not want to have pawn here. Yeah, so mm -hmm. just to talk a little bit about the white side of the Sveshnikov. So the idea is, is that you always want to have a minor piece here. That is slightly contradicted by the big variation, which is knight d5 here, when we entered this scenario. But it's okay here now, because right now white has done nothing whatsoever so far to try to keep the d5 square for their pieces, right? So we can just call it a pawn structure change. I fundamentally am uh, against this concept and I don't think I would ever play 95 Sveshnikov because I'm a bit of an old school traditionalist. And if mm -hmm. someone tells me or shows me an outpost like this, I feel it's a sin against the game of chess to not to try to exploit that. But having said that, that is, a t that is okay. But once White has started this journey of trading pieces in order to gain control of d5, you can no longer backpedal and just go like, oh, that's fine, I'll just castle and then take back with the pawn. This is completely, yeah, against the spirit of the opening. And now with e4 incoming and the bishop diagonal extending and both white minor pieces being placed very questionably, in particular the knight on a3, this is no-go zone. So what Y does is they take on E7 instead. And then they usually he play castle. And then they try to read out the knight back to E3 to cover both of these squares. So if this knight were on E3 now, we would be dead lost. Because neither F5 nor F5, uh, neither F5 nor D5 would have any reality of happening whatsoever. But okay. the knight is here. So yeah. c4 is aimed at shutting this down and accelerating the reroute of the knight to e3. So it's very important that in this line you strike the iron while it's hot. And this is typical for the Sveshnikov that if you have got just a split second of an opportunity, you must grab it right there and then or it's gone. And this okay. is it. Like there's not, no, there's not even time here to adjust the ball before you go for the shot. Uh, with castling. No, f5. You have to go after them while you can. And the logic, by the way, behind that is, is that it's actually more likely that this king is going to get in trouble whilst staying in the middle than this one. Hmm. In fact, interesting. this is exactly how the game is going to be decided very shortly. Okay. They played queen h5, a typical measure to put pressure on the white squares. Um, and now comes the crazy, and this is, by the way, just sensational chess. Um, so let's, let, let's go through logic here because it's going to actually help us to understand the beauty of this position. Taking this makes very little sense, most of the times, by the way, because it just helps white to bring the piece back to where we don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. Likewise, taking here strengthens white's grip on this diagonal. Yep. So again, we are doing something favorable to them. So then you go like, so how the heck am I supposed to challenge these guys? Well, this is how. Oh, but it's hanging. Right. Oh, but that was exactly what we discussed that we never care about. And of course, <laughs> we don't hang it for the sake of putting pawns on prey. We hang it because now we have got this insane threat of check take. And it turns yeah. out that this king desperately, desperately needed to castle before this whole pawn tension story 
arose. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two more moves, so actually one more move played in the game, and that was it. They took d5, and after fe4, uh, Psyhis resigned. Which may look to you like a premature resignation, but if you actually inspect the position a little bit more in depth, you realize that bishop e4 loses the bishop. Right. And if the bishop goes to blah, after check takes, these two are hanging and they are not defensible. Yeah. So that's yeah. it. Check, king, wherever, takes and c, yeah, wouldn't want to be, yeah. It's over. This is how yeah. a top grandmaster got absolutely outclassed and wiped off of the board in the Sveshnikov. And this is, Daniel, typically uh, a very good demonstration of the idea that I told you that white in the Sveshnikov traditionally doesn't get to attack you. They are trying yeah. to exploit the positional factors. And this gives you a lot of scope for creativity because it's not like fighting, what is the expression, fire with fire? But, you know, it's yeah. the opposites. Like, this is where you are bringing your fire and they are bringing their ice. And whoever has the, the stronger power is going to win. It's not a I attack your king, you attack my king, and whoever is the faster wins. No. It's a lot more fun from your point of view because your, king's, uh, your attack on the center and the king is going to be unique in that they are not going to do the same to you. And that's a, a lot of fun in that regard that, uh, yeah, if you get mated in the Sveshnikov, you do something really, really, really horrid with black. <laughs> like it's white. If the game is over in the Sveshnikov with a mate, it's meant to be a black win. Hmm. Uh, that's that's the, the long story short. By the way, uh, the main theoretical lines here after castles, and I just wanted to model this to you so that you see some of these ideas, is that we castle, although F5 is also played here, and after c3, um, you can see that d5 is, for example, a move here. And th this is it, man. Like, this is exactly the spirit of the opening. And the idea here is, is that if they take you, you play e4. And if the bishop drops back, you play b4. And you're just going like, take my pawns, because it's about opening up the diagonals, one or the mm. other. And now after takes, bishop takes b2, um, there is already quite a bit of pressure here. Yeah. yeah. Now, it is actually happen. It happens to be a non-win for black because after rook b1 takes, queen check wins the bishop back. And this is also, Daniel, uh, a very strong heads up for you here that you have to be man amazingly sharp tactically. Okay. Like a Sveshnikov player wins a Sveshnikov game because he out-calculates the hell out of their opponent. That's mm. it. That There's no other way around it. So if your calculation is inferior to your opponent's, almost certainly you are headed for disaster. I see. That's the, like, you must be absolutely on point with your calculation. Um, all right. Um, that was one that I really, really wanted to show you. And uh, I have got another one, which is actually the most similar to the game that you played. Okay. Um, and that's such an interesting one. So here, Nick the Fear, an, an, uh, a very well-known uh, opening theoretician from the US against uh, Francisco Vallejo, who later went on to become Spain's strongest uh, GM, barring Shirov's uh, migration to the country. Um, yeah, so Sveshiko again, A4. Now, my take on this, Daniel, is, is that everything that is not Bishop G5 is not a serious challenge against the Sveshnikov. 95 is to some degree, but like these a4, bishop e3, bishop e2, lemony moves, nah. Mm -hmm. Nah. Okay. A3, ni uh, a6, knight a3, bishop g4. Now, this is a very surprising move at first sight because you do not want to trade light squared bishops. Okay. On paper. The reason being, that's your piece to cover the d5 square. I see. But the calculation always outweighs positional considerations. And it so happens that bishop e2 take, take, and queen takes allows you d5. And if you get to play d5, there is no argument against trading the light squared bishops. Yeah. If you get to break d5 in the Sveshnikov, white is doing <laughs> something really, really poorly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is it. And so... 
after bishop g4, the super ugly f3 is forced. Hmm. Now, when I say super ugly, you could say that, oh, but we play this in a lot of open. Yeah, we do. We do in the English attack, where we castle here and we attack here. But this right. is not the English attack. White does not have the intention to do attack here. Neither should they. And actually, the weakening of this diagonal can be an important factor. Mm -hmm. Now, they played bishop e3. In my opinion, this opening has already completely derailed for white because we are failing to control the d5 square. Yep. Yeah? Now, I think the immediate d5 is good here, but it leads to masses of trades, after which the win is not guaranteed. So instead, Yahoo went with knight b4, adding another dude covering d5 and ensuring that after take, 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 we don't have to trade queens as well. Because now after knight d5, oh, sorry, d5, knight d5, knight d5, I have knight d5 and the bishop hangs on e3, so happy days. <laughs> so knight b4 was played, knight c4 was played, and d5. And again, like, you do not care about knight b6. Of course, the refutation, as always, is tactical. <laughs> and you disconnected the two, they take the rook, you take back, and they're going to lose one of the pieces. Easy peasy. Right. So they played bishop b6, queen e7. Now this may look ugly, but in fact it's a very handy move in many ways because if the bishop abandons this diagonal, you can castle here and bring the rook right away. Had you played nice. the queen to d7, when the bishop abandons later on after the trades, if the bishop abandons the square, then maybe knight b6 can be annoying at times. Right. Yeah, but it was a possibility. Anyway, takes, 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 takes. And also another big point behind this, by the way, is the possibility of a check. Mm -hmm. Bishop f2, rook d8. That is such a sad move. Why don't they castle, man? <laughs> What's wrong with these people? They don't like aggressive chess. I'm genuinely curious about castles here. Let's see, is it bad? Yeah, apparently it is very bad because it's not on the top two move list. Oh, actually, after queen c7, that was castle. Let's, let me just play this. No, no, totally killing it too. Good, okay. Yep. Rook d8, rook d8 better though. So now you have got various knight jumps uh, threatened. So queen d2 was played, knight b4, attack, attack. And now I understand why rook d8 was played. Because if he had castles, now after queen c3, we would be looking to have to defend this check. I see. Hence the move. Queen g5, super filth. Threatening, uh, well, it's floating a mate threat on d2, which is not difficult to see that it's possible, given that the knight that is guarding that square is already on prey. Rook d1 was played, and... Uh, why he'll catch in like an absolute chad. Takes, takes, and check. Once again, no mucking around, just going for kill. Knight d2. Now, castles would be very much in spirit of uh, the Morphe Opera game and then take and then rook d2. Okay. And I very sincerely doubt that there is anything wrong with that. But bishop f5 is even more aggressive. And now the queen has very limited squares to go to. In fact, c1 only to defend the d2 still. And now after rook c8, uh, white is embarrassed to have to tuck, uh, tuck the queen away on a1. That's when you know that you won the game. <laughs> right. I mean, hello. Bishop c2 was played. I'm guessing that uh, black should have... Abundance of winning moves available here. What's wrong with rook c2? Huh. Hmm. Yeah, the, there is an engine analysis here mentioning rook c2, bishop p2, check, king f1 castles, which is just completely killing it. Completely killing it. Uh, bishop c2 was played. I mean, that's quite brutal too with the idea of taking and winning the d2 knight as well. Queen f4, g3, and it is Mr. Lorna to play. Hmm. 
Let's see. I, hmm. So looking at uh, queen takes f3, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out what white's best response would be after that. Um, valid question. What about rook g1? Okay. Let's see. Hmm. I'm trying to yeah, trying to avoid just taking material and looking for potential sequences that lead to mate. Mm. I mean, obviously, you you have the exchange after after rook g1. To, you know, bishop takes uh, d1. But um... yeah, look. To be honest, Daniel, we're so winning. I don't really think it matters. Like after he here, if you just play rook d8, I mean, what did they do? Just putting more pressure, yeah, yeah. And also, um, I wanted to say take on d1 twice and rook d8, but then bishop e1 still holds. So that doesn't quite win. And additionally, you have e4 here with the brutal threat of e3. Okay, yeah, I didn't, I missed that. I didn't look at that. Uh, that like, this is just carnage. They played here rook h2. And then uh, queen after f3, queen takes f3 was was taken or was played. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rook h2. Nice, nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Check, takes, takes, and Rook d8 just mobbed up. Yeah, this is yeah. No way to defend. Uh, no way to defend d2. Right, right. And uh, yeah, man, this is what wow. it's all, where it's at. So this is great. Well, it sounds the the qualities that you said about the the Sveshnikov sound like exactly what I need to be working on anyhow. So it seems like an ideal opening for me. Well, yes, <laughs> it, it is either going to you know very crudely highlight your weaknesses or support your growth. Right. Well, but I feel like the the pressure on my or weaknesses both. is probably a good thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You will be pushed into looking for regression uh, all the way. Now I think it would be a good time, Daniel, to have a look at that game. Uh, I just don't really want to go onto my email account right now, given that I'm on full screen. Um, is there a chance you can send me the link for the game, Daniel? Yeah. That's can we what... put it in the chat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But just okay. the, just this Vashnikov game that you lost. Okay, let's see. Which is um, I think the third game on the uh on the bio, in the batch batch that you sent me in the email. Okay, yes. One second, let me pull that up. Let's see. By the way, I'm going to add you to this study so that you can use this as your little um, go-to game collection to gain inspiration to kick butts in the Sveshnikov. Okay. Um, we good? Let's. Uh, just trying to pick it out. I think it was the the last one. Possibly, possibly. Um, let me. I just want to double check to make sure this is the right one. It's I a Sveshnikov, so yeah, there was only one Sveshnikov among them that I that I played. Okay, okay. Then this has to be it. Um. Okay. Share. Okay, I'll just gonna paste the, the entire PGN in the Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Is it in the Zoom chat? <laughs> it's, if it'll let me. Why isn't it letting me? <laughs> I just copied it. I don't know why it's not. Uh... I mean I can go to your chess.com account and just look it up. 
Um, yeah, let me see if I just share the link instead, if that works better. There we go. Oh, yeah, it did come through. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, let's go to this link. I'm not sure how well I remember this one anyhow. Actually, you know what? Um, let's go here. This is a bit cleaner for my liking. Okay, so we went ta -ra -ta -ra -ta -ra -ta -ra -ra -ta -ra bishop e3. So that's the first move that is a bit like Lasta because, yep. you know, what are you doing, bro? You are meant to come here. This is not pressuring you in any way, shape or form. Right. Now, right here, um, you decided not to take. And I would argue that that already was a very powerful concept there to do. Hmm. Because okay. the, the mantra is, is that they don't want to retake with the pawn. And queen retakes may invite bishop b7 when this queen is feeling uh, very upset about life. Um, <laughs> because of uh, it has to go and that gradually leads us uh, to the loss of uh, the d5 square or the control of the d5 square, if you will. Right. Yeah, now I understand that. Yeah, so this is why I wanted to go real hard on the on the anchor games and unfortunately there was one that i forgot to add to the study that would be particularly relevant to this game but we will get there so we played rook b8 here i don't like this move at all uh, i mean i understand that you try to negate this so it's logical right. but right. uh it, it's not where i would go the funny thing is is that um your good friend uh the fish i think approves of this Every boy, <laughs> now your opponent is really asking for it. And here too, I find probably bishop e7 already a bit timid. And again, I would be going after them with knight d5 for sure. Yeah, I didn't understand at the time that that was the right approach. So tak tak and potentially either bishop e7 or defend the knight and then bishop e6. Okay. And we are looking great. They so played bishop e7, they played queen d2. Now it's it's like begging to be captured. Like even now, if you didn't know this should be coming, because uh, I mean, part of the issue, Daniel, here is, and this actually leads to that game that I wanted to talk to you about, right? So uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that the reason why you didn't take it now is because after e d5, you have nowhere to go. Yeah, the idea that I should just let the pawn hang, right? On, on d4 and it doesn't matter. That's totally now. Exactly, yep. Daniel. So the idea is, I'm glad that you hammered it so well, is that after <laughs> take, 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 this bishop is worth its weight in gold, man. Like, look at these diagonals, dude. And this yeah. one too, by the way. Holy right. cow. Speaking of a Sveshnikov wet dream, with this knight here and the bishop coming with f6 tempo, check here. Oh my god. Your name will be changed from Lorna to Carnage. <laughs> so yeah, I think my evaluation was off here because I've got, I've gotten out of the mindset of dismissing a line just because it hangs a pawn, but I struggled to see how I would benefit if I did, and so I I wasn't evaluating. I mean, if you saw just Bishop F six, yeah. that alone I don't see how White handles. Let alone the check, the queen b6, the b4, all of that. Just, just let's 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 try to deal with bishop f6. How does white do that? Right. Yep. Yeah, like yeah, it, right. I already have to play like crazy town moves, and it's not fixing the problem. Like b4 is coming, rook e8 check, queen b6. <sighs> Boy, yeah. like this is how you are going to score some amazing victories. And that's exactly, Daniel, like how I expect, by the way, the 1500 level, excuse me, to play against the Sveshnikov unless they have proper opening prep. That they are going to confuse various uh, Sicilian lines, such as this English attack setup, but with the light on A3, it's like... 
<laughs> it's literally like going to war, but instead of taking your shield and your sword, you take a paintbrush and a palette and you go like, here I am. I have come to fight. And you, you'd really? Like with that? Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. So yeah, yeah this is on White's end, complete misunderstanding of uh, the position and the situation. And so as such, castles has to be labeled as a mistake. Right. Yeah. Likewise, again, take, take knight d4 was super, super, super sensational. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we played bishop e6. And uh, I have a problem with that move too, because normally you would want to rather take on d5 with knight rather than bishop. But now you actually deprived right. yourself from taking with the knight because now this is a fork. Right. Yeah. All right. So we went c4, or well, that they did. Mm-hmm. And we talk, talk, and once again, as much as this is no longer Sveshnikov, by the way, in terms of structure, this is a King's Indian structure now. Hmm. Okay. And as such, this was now for King's Indian reasons, an absolute must to go for. We take, take here and then Knight D7 and then compensation on the dark squares again. I see. I see. So different motif structure slightly and definitely different pawn structure, but identical uh, approach to the problem uh, okay. is what I would have liked to see here. Um, I think from memory, the engine likes takes. Yeah. <clears throat> and then take, take and knight b4. That is also quite powerful. Okay. okay. Like, as a general rule of thumb, Daniel, in the Sveshikov, if your opponent's king is not castled, you constantly seek confrontation. Okay. Forcing variations. Because what it does is, is that it continuously disallows them to castle because there's something always happening. There's something always to respond to. And eventually it snowballs into a problem where uh, by dodging all these threats, inevitably it's going to be the king that suffers the main damage. Okay. So, although here it's I, simply d5 is gone. Yeah, the, I think this would have, I think this was my first class, may have been my first classical game playing the Sveshnikov and the course that I'm studying. I know this is, like you said, no longer really a Sveshnikov structure. So that's probably why it works here. But in the course, it said that uh, rarely is it good to uh, like have to respond to c4 with b takes c4. Uh, so I think I had it in my mind that that probably would have been a mistake. Yeah, I oof, I would take that with a pinch of salt. Like, okay. I, I, I would rephrase that, that BC is generally bad unless it wins by force. Okay. Which makes it a really stupid statement to make, right? Because then we, <laughs> we, we can't make general statements. Right. Yeah, so it, it, it is the same, like, uh, you know, uh, giving up the D5 square is bad for white unless it wins by force. So yes, in general, it's bad. And in general, this is bad too. But since your opponent has played about four moves that have nothing to do with the Sveshnikov, <laughs> rules that apply to the Sveshnikov may not be applicable here. Right, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, and this is Daniel on ultimate no-go. So here you sacrifice the knight. Yeah. Yeah, so we are playing with the knight down for the rest of the game, unless you get to break with the a5 extremely soon, which uh, is definitely a, a bit of a sadness. So here, like it or not, you have to go knight c4. I see. Yeah. Because at least that creates some, you know, action on the board. The rook becomes alive. But now what are we playing for? You know, like we are in a sterile dead position where the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think, Daniel, that uh, this is completely the wrong direction. Like, we should be playing kingside here. As per pawn chain theory, by the way. Yep. Now, yeah. it's extremely difficult to play on the kingside with a knight like this. 
Mm -hmm. But the idea behind knight d h5 is still to sack a pawn here to trigger the trade of this bishop, which would come with some kind of activity on the dark squares and on the dark diagonals. And if your knight wasn't okay. so tragically bad, it would be quite an interesting <laughs> position. I mean, actually, I can attempt playing here a5 and revive the knight here. And this looks quite playable, actually. I mean, it's costing me two pawns. Oh, maybe three. Oh, actually, no, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm misblundering this. So, yeah, as you can see, it's it's not that obvious to win for white, even though the position is clearly better. Yeah. But we have this knight h5, knight f4 idea, and if they don't engage with that, you can go bishop g5 or f5, and that's the usual Sveshnikov thing to do. Uh, I'm not even right. sure where you are going. Like, okay, you go to b6, and then what? Because on a4, we don't yeah. do anything, and c4 is not eligible. Uh, it's not doable right yeah I, I i think yeah i was i forget what it was but i was i was thinking of playing i moved the knight out of the way because i wanted to oh you wanted to play f5 yeah right yeah, yeah fair okay but then i think there was something after that i realized it didn't work for some reason i mean look rook c6 is carnage here and frankly yeah. um yeah oh yeah they did they did play rook c6 yeah okay It was good, by the way, that you went for a5 because that was the only way to revive that knight. So I'm glad that you did that. And that was yeah. great. As far as positional chess is concerned, best thing you have done in the entire game for sure so far was to allow yourself to reroute that knight. Okay. Um, I would definitely slide sidestep this trade and create a pin if I can help it, and then go from here. I really don't like this move because I'm afraid that after take, take, we just have not, like, what are we playing for here? So he has got this, and he even has a chance here to change the structure like so, with the subsequent d6 and the bishop coming into play here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not excited that. about either of these. So once again, your goal here is to try to turn this into some kind of an imbalance. So now we have a pin mm. here. You dodge the trade and you're about to go bishop g5 once again to play on the soft dark squares. I see. I see. Yeah, I struggle to find a path forward here. Yeah. Once again, this is not a Sveshnikov. You are right. But the Sveshnikov <laughs> mentality is that every single move you play has to be annoying. Yeah. yeah. This is not an annoying move. This is just like, thank you, I wanted to trade anyway. This is an annoying move. Because it dodges the trade and it creates a pin. Mm -hmm. This puts pressure on your yeah. opponent. Um, ooh. How is this not begging for f5? true it was something i was looking for to do earlier i don't know well precisely daniel like if there was a time yeah. ever to throw that in it's like hello yeah yeah and like i don't know what this is i think that was a time pressure move to figure out what i wanted to do next <laughs> i hadn't come up with a plan yet so it was just buying time oh boy what was the time control uh, 45, 45. I probably just had a handful of minutes left on the clock. Right. I don't know. By the way, it does support yeah. bishop g5, so it has a positional merit. But I'm very afraid that that was not why it was played. No, uh, I mean, it was it was lack of finding a plan and just buying a little more time to think about what to do. Because I didn't want to waste time and I couldn't come up with one yet. I wish you had played this. Because here there is a tactic here. We take, take, knight takes d6, queen b6. Hitting this, hitting this. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I think you're winning. Because <laughs> if knight c4, then this is a double check. So the queen is not hanging. This is Daniel again, the textbook move that you have to be annoying. All yeah. the time, every yeah. time, every move. 
And by the way, as much as I hate to tell you this, but this is the the gut instinct move that you would play if you had 10 seconds. Okay. Because that fits every single build that we live by in this position. You have a garbage or black bishop, they have a great one. That's where their weak squares are. That's what exposes the king. That's what allows you to come in here. None of this requires calculation. It's all just superfluous observation of good bishop, bad bishop, the, the basics. And right. this violates yeah. exactly that. Because now you gave up your c-file, you took their bad bishop, and you gave up your best knight. Okay. So if I wanted yeah. to be harsh, which I don't, I would say that this is typically the move that you should never ever play even with five seconds on the clock. Because that just goes against everything that we want to adhere or observe or obey. But um, yeah. yeah, this uh, it takes a lot of time, this skill to develop uh, and become a second nature so that even when under time pressure you don't do it. Like you have got just nothing to play for now. Yeah. And yeah, th this is now falling apart. Oh, that was a, a spectacular blunderoo there. Hello? Yeah, that, that was sad by the opponent. Queen c4 would have been sufficient. Were they in time trouble too? Uh, no, my opponents never are. <laughs> Uh, not in classical. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I did. I did catch that mistake though when he made it. At least I, was, I saw. I saw. That was like my one glimmer of something good in the game. Yeah. Uh... Okay. I have got a friend called Nimzovic. He told me something about past pawns. Do you know what that was? Uh, I don't know what Nimzovic said about it. Pass pawns, uh, they should be pushed. That's what Nimzovic said, sir. Okay. <laughs> because that's how he developed his blockade theory. Mm -hmm. That a pass okay. pawn has to be blockaded. So they are absolutely the closest relatives. I see. I see. And he, Daniel, after c4, I think we are close to winning. I mean, this bishop is going to be absolutely ripping into that king. It's actually mm. not so much about being pushed, uh, the pass pawn that is, but it's just uh, opening up fast and diagonals. I see. Hmm. This looks to me like it's carnage. I mean, I don't I... remember why I didn't do that. Yeah. And uh, conversely, if you don't play c4 here, they're going to blockade it. Nimzovic. And we are screwed for game, like for life. Like this is yeah. an ultimate textbook light squared color complex domination where you just lost every single light square on the entire board. And you have a whole awful bishop. And in strong yeah. contrast to that, pff, the biggest beast on the board. And no domination of light squares anymore. In fact, you have got now access to light squares that you never had before. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was a bit of hope chess, I think. Like again, Queen C4, blockade. Nimzovic is, is a good dude to listen to. Highly recommended. Oh, right. so now we are back in the game again. Okay. We didn't like the check. Oh, you wanted to move out of this, perhaps? Maybe. Um, don't remember what my thinking was. Yeah, I don't like Daniel the fact that we're trying to utilize this diagonal with the queen, given we have a bishop. It just mm -hmm. seems to me to be extremely uneconomical. Because my idea is is that now I want to come in here. Okay. Like my bishop is boss here, and my queen is boss here. If they take it, bishop d4. And I'm... You don't necessarily... Yeah? Well, if he trades it off. Trades what right? off? Uh, the bishop. Well, I don't know if I have a check here. In fact, I do know that I do have the check. So now, worst case scenario, I have got a perpetual check. Now, you may not have liked that. Mm. So okay. now, check, check. And this is a perpetual check here, here. I see. I'm not sure if that's my best with black, by the way.
I assume it is though. But yeah, I would be definitely very keen on on bringing this dude in. Okay. Okay, you went he here. So now queen d4 looks like a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah, we seem to have missed that ball too. Although bishop h4 I do like with the aggressi aggressive idea of here. Queen f3 seems right. to be cutting, uh, covering. Oh, but a4 is hanging. Yeah, this is this is looking exciting now. Like it feels like we are putting some hurt on. Hmm. What's wrong with my queen f2 here? Because if I could help it, I would like to go forward, not back, right? Right. Maybe I was thinking. Okay, so king g4 after that. Um... I did not hear that, Daniel. What is the point of king g4? Okay, it looks like you're walking into mate for no reason. Like I don't have a threat after king queen f2. You realize that? <laughs> right. Right. Um... I just went there to defend the bishop. That's exactly why I'm not super excited about yeah. this because I don't have a threat and I hate that. Right. I would be worried about queen e3, probably. Because after the trade, the pawn becomes very weak. Yeah. I see. Anyway, let's move on. Ooh. Yeah, so... I don't know how good this is, Daniel, but in terms of mentality here too, man, like we're defending a pawn when your opponent's king is stark naked. Like this would not okay. come up on my radar at all as like first five candidate moves. My first candidate move is h5. Hmm. Okay. And it's, I'm loving it a lot because h5 threatens this check, threatens this check. It's pooping all over this king. So I'm not even going to tell you that my second one is g5, which also is intending to expose the king to everything. Okay. So this okay. is a classical case, Daniel, of a typically non-Sveshnikov, non although this does remind me in some ways of Sveshnikov position, where you need to apply Sveshnikov mentality. Yeah. And remember how I told you that you need to be constantly annoying, which means threatening. This is not threatening. This is defensive chess. Yes, you do have that, but nah. You had here h5, man. This is a ripper. Mm. Like, you are going after the king like crazy. Yeah, h5 wasn't a candidate move for me. Now, um, I have to give that to you, though, that bringing the queen here was great, but it didn't quite do the damage we wanted to. Oh, maybe. Yeah. I love the fact that you managed to come in here, though. So, kudos for that. Okay. Most definitely kudos for that. This one, though, seems to be missing the mark, so it should go here, right? So that you attack, you defend, you attack. Right. That right. That, uh, that has a multi-function there. On here, you are forcing your opponent to play a correct, annoying move. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a big, big no-go. Yeah, and ironically now, they managed to drum up an attack. Okay, take, check, king back, take, take is perpetual check, right? Hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the general mantra, Daniel, of coming back, moving backwards. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I know that I never said that before. That's good because we always hear something new that we can rely on, right? Yeah, and it fell apart. Look, it wasn't too bad, but um, you did see that. Uh, um, yeah, based on what we discussed in the beginning of this lesson, now you would play this game very, very differently. Right, yeah. yeah. For sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, I felt it was hard for me to come back after that like middle game position where mm. he had his pawns pushing forward. I, I struggle. And like you said, the, the terrible night, I think it was on B7. Uh, after that, I just really struggled to find, uh, yeah. to get into an advantageous position. Right exactly. Now. Yeah. 
Yeah. Radio, Daniel, unfortunately, I got a bouncer, so we are going to call no it here. Uh, but this hopefully sets you up for success, uh, or at least on the right path with learning your Sveshnikov and understanding it better. So best of luck, yeah. and um, yeah, um, we will see each other again next Friday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I want to confirm just uh, that, that 